like I said, I am. I, I apologize that I lied to you last week that we were going to talk about after. I, I just thought I want everybody to hear this next message in regards to Esther because of the importance of it. So this is also important and a little bit of a challenge to me, if I'm honest, because if what I'm about to share with you tonight is true, it kind of rocks my world in some of the things that I kind of hold dear, but not dear enough that I'm going to make a doctrine out of what I believe. And you'll understand as I go on. But nonetheless, it's, it's going to rock my world a little bit if this is true. And so I'm going to kind of share some things that, you know, uh, maybe could be troubling. I don't know if troubling is really the best word, but challenge us, okay? And so what I'm going to do is share some things that uh, there's a, a Nathan Hoffman who talks about this and uh, that's kind of where kind of it was introduced to me and I just am having a hard time finding any way where it's wrong biblically. And not to say that it is going to uh, redirect my thinking in any way as far as, you know, the Lord and whatnot, but as some of my theories, it does challenge. You'll see as we go. So, um, basically, he starts talking about the pyramids. There's a lot of people out there who, in the church, that a lot of people ask me, they think that maybe the pyramids were built before Noah's flood. Now, there's reasons for that. The main reason is the timing of that, and we're going to share some guidelines so I won't get into the details, but bottom line is if we believe the secular world when the pyramids were built, and we believe what the Bible says when Noah's flood came, the pyramids were built long before Noah's flood. And there's going to be some issues with that, as you'll see. But what I want to share is the difference between the Masoretic text and the Greek text. Now, what is that? The Masoretic text is simply the, I don't want to say original. We don't have the original. But it is the, the copy that most of our Bible translations come from. I'll show you, you know, the New King James, uh, the NIV, I believe the RSV. I mean, just about everything is coming from the Masoretic text. Then I have been using, as I said, the Greek Septuagint a number of times here as we've gone through Esther and whatnot. Um, all that is, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. However... The Greek Septuagint is much, much older than the Masoretic text, and I'll give you dates coming up. And so, there's a lot, and by no means are we going to say it's perfect either, but let me just give you some examples here. In uh, verse 12 of Genesis chapter 11, it says, When Arphaxad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And then in verse 14, when Sheila had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. In the Greek Septuagint, it says, Now Arphaxad had lived 135 years and begat Canaan. And then it goes down, Now Selah lived 130 years and begat Eber. There are a hundred years missing. And not just in those two, but as you look in that same chapter, in each of those verses, you will see our Faxid in the Masoretic text says 35 years. The Greek Septuagint says 135. Sheila, Eber, Peleg, Ru, and Sarag, all of them are missing 100 years. That is a 600-year difference when it comes to how old this earth is. Because when we get the age of the earth, we typically hear usher, Usher's chronology, and he begins it in 4004 BC, which I do tend to believe is probably right for creation. This is a little side note. I may have mentioned it before. I don't know. But I knew a guy who claimed he could date the day of creation, and I thought, you're nuts, you're crazy, because that kind of thing I stay away from. Well, after spending three days with him at, around a table, showing me in scriptures, 
I became convinced that he might be right. Now, the reason that is, is because astronomy, he says, is an exact science. Astronomy being an exact science, all we got to do is look at what we got now, where the sun is, where the moon is, where this star is, and you just let it go backwards. And when we do that, we see some very interesting timelines. Now, like I said, I'm pretty sure I told some of you this anyway, but back in 1995, and I've still got it in my office here, the um, National Geographic magazine had said that there were five planets that were going to be within a 15 degree alignment with one another, and that had not happened in billions of years. So this Dr. Eugene Falstick, who this guy that I spent my time with around the table was, he sent them a letter to the Harvard Astrophysics Department, which is the one that National Geographic was quoting, and said, check this date out, and it was May something of 4004 BC. And I have a copy of that in my office of them saying, you're right. Now, National Geographic never did any recanting or saying, oh, you know, we were wrong. But nonetheless, you go to that date, and all nine planets are within two degree alignment with one another. And he showed me a verse in Isaiah that talks about at creation that all the wandering stars basically are lined up or arrayed like an army. And so what he was saying is that when God created everything, they were all lined up and then everything starts its motion. And there you have it. And it just so happens to line up with Usher's chronology of 4004 BC. All right. Now, so I have those kind of things, but I'm not going to base my faith in scripture or a doctrine based on something like that. Those are things that I store in the back of my mind and go, hmm, interesting. Okay. So, what I want to show you here, though, is that the Hebrew Masoretic text, as I said, is missing 600 years. The Greek Septuagint has those 600 years in there. So does the Samaritan Pentateuch. We'll talk about that coming up. Flavius Josephus, in his writings, is quoting the Septuagint, it seems, because he too has that extra hundred years for those ages in there. So when we look at these versions like the New King James, the NIV, the NASB, all of these plus most of the others are coming, as I said, from the Masoretic text. Not saying the Masoretic text is a bad thing, I'm just saying there may be a mistake, possibly, in that. So when we talk about, oh, you're, you're saying there's a mistake in the Bible? No, I'm not. I'm saying there's a mistake in the Masoretic copy, not in the originals. So when we talk about the inspiration of God, the, the uh, inerrancy of God, we're not talking about the NIV Bible or the New King James Bible. We're talking about the original manuscripts. That is the inspired, inerrant word of God. And the goal of copying translations is to hopefully be as accurate to those originals as possible. Now, when we get into like the modern NIV and Living Bible and uh, the uh, Message Bible and things like that, okay, we've strayed from trying to be as accurate to that as possible. That's to make it more readable and understandable, and I would never want to get any doctrine out of any of those kind of things. But nonetheless, what I want you to see is the Masoretic text is from 1008 A.D. That is when that was put together. When we look at the Greek Septuagint, it goes all the way back to 250 B.C., so, a thousand years plus older, um, which is pretty significant. So, when Josephus is writing, he doesn't even have the Masoretic text to look at. He has to be using the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, or maybe an older original copy. We're going to see that the Dead Sea Scrolls seems to side most often with the Septuagint as well. Yeah. What we see some of the differences, there are proper nouns that are spelled out 
with Greek vowels, whereas the Hebrew texts don't. Okay, they don't use the vowels. Um, we also see the Greek Septuagint has some of the apocryphal books. I have quoted things like Enoch. However, Enoch is not in the Greek Septuagint. Um, but it included Jubilees, uh, the first two books of Maccabees. There's two other ones that were not included in it, three and four. Um, we see Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Baruch, Sirach. These are in the Greek Septuagint, okay? uh, including a, a letter of Jeremiah. As I mentioned before, as we've been going through the book of Esther, there are extra chapters and extra paragraphs to make Esther thicker, as we said. Um, Daniel has the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> those are some of the differences that we see. Um, the Samaritan Pentateuch is about 100 BC. Now, I don't know a lot about the Samaritan Pentateuch myself. I just know that in this case it's agreeing with the Septuagint. Now, I know that Daniel, Joseph, often talks about two or three witnesses, that anything in Scripture you need two or three witnesses. And so I know that Nathan kind of talked about that in, in relation to this, that we have three witnesses saying that the Greek Septuagint seems to be accurate when it's coming to the age of these people. Uh, the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and Flavius Josephus. I will definitely not put them all on equal footing, especially Flavius Josephus. He's a historian. We know some things that he recorded are, seem to be inaccurate. Um, like I said, the Samaritan Pentateuch, I don't know. The Greek Septuagint, I'll put that as a pretty accurate thing based on the fact that the Jews were using that uh, at the time of Christ. But couldn't two and three have come from one? And Absolutely could have. And where did number one come from? It must have been some even original text further back that we don't have today. What I am saying is that there is a discrepancy between the Masoretic and the Greek Septuagint, and you're going to see some other examples coming up. Nonetheless, we do know that the Masoretic text has dropped off this 600 years. Now, why that is important, you're going to understand here in a moment. But I want to show you, this is the typical thing that we see. Answers in Genesis uses it. Kent, Kent Hovind used uh, maps like this. I would say 99.9% .9 of all Christianity, if you look at the age of people, you're going to hear things like this. And I have said this myself. Abraham lived and knew Shem. Noah, Adam, knew Noah. Noah would have known, you know, Shem, obviously it's his son, would have known Abraham. So you get these four people, you have from creation to Abraham. That's not much. And maybe you've heard that before. Well, that is assuming the Masoretic text is correct. Because what we see here is this, that Shem is going to die here. Now you can kind of see a natural progression for the most part, but he outlives his sons, his grandsons, his great-grandsons, all the way down the line. All of these are people he outlived, and he saw the death of all of them then. Okay, not impossible, but nonetheless, it is strange when we look at the whole list. This is just a short list of them. Everybody, you know, the fathers <clears throat> are not dying or are dying before their grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren on the whole progression of the biblical timeline, and except for this right here. If those extra 600 years are supposed to be in there, then it looks like this, and it's more natural. The progression seems to be right. Again, I can't make a doctrine out of this, but common sense seems to make more sense with this. So, as I said, Shem died 
500 years before Abraham is born then. Again, the, the two witnesses here, there's one other aspect of other than this 100 years being dropped, and that is in a guy named Nahor, right? Abraham's relative, close relative there. Nahor, uh, the Septuagint has him as 79 years old, and all the rest have it at 29 years old, or the Septuagint, or the Masoretic, I mean. And so as a result, there's another 50 years. So that means 650 years could be missing if the Septuagint is right. Here's what they're saying about the pyramids. Um, the pyramids of Giza, they're saying are um, around 23, actually it's before 2350 BC, I think. Let me see if I can understand my notes here properly. But yeah, uh, somewhere in there. But anyway, they are basically just before Noah's flood. Well, the Giza pyramids are even newer than the step pyramids. The step pyramids are supposed to be one of the first ones, so that backs up even another 150 years or so. And so as a result, you've got all of these pyramids that were built before the flood happened under the Masoretic text and what it's saying. There, now again, maybe the Egyptian chronology is wrong, which I know it is. There's no question in my mind about that. However, it's more the dynasties that seem to be wrong in some cases. But anyway, so there could be a possible fix to this regardless of what I'm saying, but I'm not going to go down that road tonight. Now, I do not believe the pyramids are pre-flood, and we'll get some reasons for that. But if you add these 650 years that the Septuagint would have, that means then that Noah's flood is backed up 650 years to about 3000 BC rather than 2350 BC. Which now then puts the flood a long time before the pyramids are built. Enough time to get a population built up to build the pyramids again, which we'll talk about. One of the issues is then you have at least 550 years to build up, as I said, a world's population. We know that after the flood, what happens? You've got the Tower of Babel. Well, we're going to kind of give you a little bit more detail on this later, so I won't give you the numbers. But there just doesn't seem to be enough time. If the Masoretic text is true and our dates are right, from the time of the flood to the time of Babel, you don't have enough to get people to bring and spread out into 70 nations, which I'll give you numbers here coming up. Typically, Babel is uh, put at the time of the uh, Peleg. And we read about this in Genesis 10.25. It says, in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Now, I... Again, there's two different ways of interpreting this. I think that Peleg is around the time of Babel, but it doesn't have to be Babel. This could also be evidence of a population separation. That we had the Tower of Babel already happen, they spread out, and then the Ice Age begins to end because the Ice Age would have taken a lot of the waters into ice. If you lower the oceans just by 150 feet today, you have land continents, or the con land continents are connected by land bridges. All right, so just 150 feet. So if you take the water and put it in the ice, the oceans are lowered by 150 feet. You have land bridges. So at the Tower of Babel, that allowed people to cross and get to other places. Then, in the days of Peleg, the Ice Age is ending, the waters begin to rise, those land bridges are now covered, and the earth is divided. So that's another, that's the interpretation that I've been teaching for years and years and years. All right? Anyway, um, we know that Peleg's father is Eber. Now, Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from, technically. The Hebrew, the, I can't say the word, Ibiru, 
is basically what it would be, and so that's where we get that from. Uh, Josephus says this, Sala was the son of Arphaxad, and his son was Heber, from whom they originally called the Jews Hebrews. Heber begat Joktan and Peleg, which is Peleg. He was called Peleg because he was born at the dispersion of the nations to their several countries, for Peleg among the Jews signifies division. So, basically what we've been saying, just Josephus confirming it. Well, the Masoretic text is only going to give us a hundred years from Noah's flood to the time of Babel. One hundred years is all. And if you have eight people on Noah's ark, how many people can you get from eight in a hundred years? Not very many. They say that at the minimum, there's discrepancies. 30,000 people were used to help build the Pyramid of Khufu. Some say up to 100,000. I think Herodotus records 100,000. But even so, 30,000. It took that many to build a pyramid. When they are building the Tower of Babel, we're not talking about this little statue. I think we're talking like a pyramid, more than likely. If the Greek text is correct, the Septuagint, and those hundred years are there, now we have at least 400 years from the flood to the birth of Peleg. So will 400 years give us enough time to get the population up? Yes, it does. We know that the population growth today is about 3.2%. Um, here we see different countries, I guess, and their growth rate. Okay, now this is a pretty fast growth rate. So we're being generous. These are the fastest. If you have just 100 years, and the Masoretic text is correct, and you have eight people getting off of the boat 100 years later, you would only have 186 people at that population growth. It, it, it grows exponentially. It starts out slow, and then it skyrockets. So if we have 400 years of time, and the Greek is correct, in 400 years, at that same growth rate, you get um, 2,371,203 people. So you would have plenty of time. Same exact growth rate, but just adding another 300 years to it. Like I said, it's, it, it's exponential. So let's just say that there was a higher growth rate of 8.58%. And the reason that we got that number is because it took 30,000 people to build a pyramid. To get 30,000 people from the eight people in 100 years, you need a growth rate of 8.58%, which is really unrealistic. But that's what it would take. Putting that in perspective, in 400 years, how many people would you get at that growth rate? 159 trillion people. We're not even there. We're at 7 billion today. So, as I said, that seems to be a pretty unrealistic expectation to have an 8.58%. Now, at the Tower of Babel, people spread out and they went to Egypt and all over the world. We know that Egypt was started by one of Ham's sons. Okay, uh, well son's children, grandchildren, uh, a guy named uh, Mizraim. And today, to this day, Egypt is called Mizraim in Hebrew. And when you go there, you will see the bank of Miser, uh, all of that. It's still there. It's, that's what it's called to this day. So we know that the Egyptians came from Ham, ultimately. I, I don't think there's any debate on that today. Well, anyway, yeah, so from Noah's Ark to the Tower of Babel, you'd have 400 years. From the Tower of Babel to the first pyramids being built, then you have, or at least the pyramids of Giza, you, now I guess it is the first one, you'd have about 150 years, which means then you have not all of those people from Babel going to Egypt. They're spreading out into 70 nations, it seems. 
And then from that, you have another 150 years to get enough people then to start building the pyramids. So common sense and logic seems to say that the Greek Septuagint, the numbers seem to fit better. But then that means that this earth is not 6,000 years old. That means the earth is about 6,650 years old, which is what I was trying to say before, where it puts a, a wrench in the rest of my theories. Yeah. Now, everything in me says can't be, can't be. Can we at least end on 666 then? Yeah. Or 7. 7,000. Okay. Now, again, it doesn't mean, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe this isn't right. Maybe this is right in our theory of all the patterns that I see in Scripture um, are, are just wrong. Maybe it's going to have to go to 7,000 years. And then the eighth day is the new creation, as we see in many of the festivals. Okay? One of my points in, in bringing this up tonight is this. We have to be careful not to make doctrines out of analogies and patterns. They may be right, and it's okay to consider those, but you cannot make doctrines out of them. Because we, we just don't know. Our ways are not God's ways. Give me an example of a doctrine made out of an analogy or a pattern. The Lord's got to come back because the earth is 6,000 years old, and after 6,000 years, he's going to come back. The Jews have believed that. The only place I've ever heard that is from you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Martin Luther taught it. The Jews taught it. it. This has been around from, I think, from the beginning. And so, well, here's one of the examples where the Greek Septuagint has an extra Canaan in Genesis and also in Luke. Here um, we see... Uh, our Faxid lived 135 years, he begot Canaan, and then our Faxid lives 430 years, and he begat sons and daughters, and he died. Now Canaan lived 130 years, and then you get Selah. So you have our Faxid, Canaan, Selah. And in Luke here we see the sons of Peleg, the sons of Eber, the sons of Shelah, the sons of Canaan, the sons of our Faxid. It's listed there as well. Now, our oldest known copies of the Greek do not include the extra Canaan. Only the newer copies do. Also, the oldest known copies of Luke do not have this extra Canaan. Only the newer ones do. The Samaritan Pentateuch, which we told about before that I don't know a lot about, does not have that extra Canaan in it. And Flavius Josephus does not have that extra Canaan in it. Therefore, probably not supposed to be there. Okay? We see the Masoretic text does not have that in there. And in 1 Chronicles 1.18, which seems to confirm the chronology, it does not have Canaan in there either. So anyway, here's where this is getting more important than what I've been talking about so far. Um, why are those hundred years not there in the Masoretic text? I don't know. I can't give you a definite answer, but one possibility is this. Jesus is supposed to come from, or be in the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is what Mark was saying there earlier that this is a whole line of a priesthood that doesn't even come from Levi, ultimately. It's separate. It is proposed, and that's all I can say, and I don't know if it all even makes sense to me why this would have to be this way, but that the Jews wanted to prove that Jesus was not the Messiah, keeping in mind the Masoretic text is long afterwards, after Jesus was here. And so what they did is they dropped out those hundred years so that Melchizedek could be Shem and that Shem would live at the same time that Abraham did. And therefore, they changed it by doing that. That this was 
a conspiracy of the Jews to try and deny Christ as our Messiah. A very real possibility. I really do not believe Melchizedek is Shem at all. I mean, I deny that up and down, right and left. But we do see that when you look at some of these extra biblical writings that are in the Sefer, you will see Shem and Melchizedek are kind of placed there, and you go, Shem, I didn't realize he was... There may be a corruption of that. First of all, one of the reasons I don't think there's any way, I think Melchizedek is Jesus myself in the Old Testament. There's a lot of people that might disagree with me on that, but he has no genealogy, no beginning, no end. Um, all of these things, he's king of Jerusalem, basically, king of Salem. His name means prince of peace. I mean, everything fits Jesus in my book. So the Jews believe that Melchizedek was Shem? The yeah. Jews that? The Jews will teach you that Shem was Melchizedek. Okay. So when Abraham is blessing or being blessed by Melchizedek, that it's actually Shem doing that. And Shem is considered to be, I mean, a very, he, when you were learning God's word, you would go to the house of Shem or to the tent of Shem to learn. So when we see Jacob and Esau, we often throw Jacob under the bus because he was the mama's boy. He was a, a man of the tents. And people kind of look at it, you know, he's a homebody kind of thing. That's not what man of the tents means. What that means is he was a man who studied the word. And so what you'll read about Jacob in the Jewish literatures and whatnot is that Jacob would go and learn from Shem, ultimately. I think that's what they were saying, at least from the house of Shem or whatever. So the only way that Jesus could be a priest is if he received the priesthood from Levi. And, but since Jesus is not a descendant of Levi, they will say, then he cannot be priest, and they discredit then Melchizedek by making it Shem, and therefore Jesus is not the Messiah, is kind of what they do. So again, in my mind, I don't know how that really fully discredits God, but you know, Jesus being the Messiah, but I, I don't know. So we have here, why would the Jews argue about genealogies? Was Paul referring to this kind of thing when we read in Timothy, Titus, where he says, avoid foolish disputes and genealogies? You know, three different times we see this. Why is Paul speaking about it? It seems strange that he found that important enough to mention three different times. Is it because they were trying to prove through genealogies? Don't know. Um, but it's just kind of interesting. That's just another point. Um, like I said, when we compare the Septuagint and the Masoretic, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were before Christ, almost always side with the Septuagint. And by siding with, I mean when it's quoting scriptures, it's coming from the Septuagint. When Paul and Stephen, Stephen, when he's giving his speech, he's quoting from the Septuagint. When Jesus is, um, I think I have it coming, I'll just, I'll, I'm pretty sure I have it, I do. Here is uh, Stephen, when he talks about how many people came up out of Egypt, he says 75. The Masoretic text says 70. And so... Uh, there's a discrepancy, but yet 75 is exactly what Genesis tells us. We see Jesus, when he goes into the synagogue, he quotes Isaiah 61. When he's quoting it, he's quoting it from the Septuagint. So, again, the Septuagint isn't perfect. I'm just saying about 50% of the time those verses are quoted. They're quoting it from the Septuagint. Therefore, the Jews considered the Septuagint to be good. That's as much as I can say for sure. Um, same thing here in some other places, so you get the point. One last little bit that I want to share then is how long were the Israelites slaves in Egypt? Because this is also going to play into this. And I think this is a very important thing to understand. Um, we see here in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, 
The Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Yet we go to Exodus 12:40. It says, Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. So one is saying 400 years, and one says 430 years. The length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years, says Exodus 12.40. Exodus 6.16, we see that Levi's sons, Kohath, are going into Egypt. So it says these are the names of the sons of Levi. Now, uh, according to the generations, Gershon, Kohath, Merari, the years of the life of Levi being 137. The sons of Kohath are Amram, um, and all these others, the years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. Amram took his wife, Yochebed, and Amram and Yochebed have Moses. So, giving you kind of a little timeline of who's alive, you know, when they're there in Egypt. So, basically, what we see is, assuming Kohath, we see there it said was 133 years old, Assuming he had a baby when he was born, which obviously is not true. And then Amram, his son, is born you know, when he dies. So we're, we're saying the absolute maximum of time, which really isn't even possible. You'd have 133 years of Kohath, 137 years of Amram, and then Moses lives 80 years. So you have 350 years absolute total that they could have been in Egypt because Kohath is entering Egypt. Moses leaves Egypt. And we know that's it. Are you with me? Okay. More realistically... Since we know that Kohath probably did not have a baby the day he's dying, when he's 133 years old, that it would look more like this, so that the 133, 137, and 80 are going to overlap a little bit. So, it would be less than 350 years that they could be in Egypt. But, that one verse said they lived in Egypt for 400 years or whatever. So, um, 430 years here. How can that be? That seems to be a discrepancy. Well, Paul says, from Abraham receiving the promise to the point that the law is given is 430 years. The law, which was 430 years later after Abraham receives the covenant. So, that's a, a marker Abraham received the promise when he was 75 years old, according to Genesis 12. The Bible tells us that. Abraham had Isaac 25 years later when he was 100 years old. The Bible tells us that. Isaac is 60 years old when Jacob is born. The Bible tells us that. Jacob enters e Egypt when he's 130 years old. The Bible tells us that. So that means there is 215 years from Abraham basically receiving the promise when he's 75 years old to the time that they enter Egypt when Jacob is 130 years old. So you have the 25 plus 60 plus 130, there's 215 years. Remember we said the most it could be is 350, but probably less than that seems more likely. 215 years that they would be in Egypt. Oh, until they get to Egypt, thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, so remember, Paul said 430 years from Abraham to the promise, uh, or to the law, I should say. Receiving the promise to receiving the law. So, with that in mind, then we have 215 years from Abraham receiving the promise to them entering Egypt. If it's 430 years from receiving the covenant to the law being given, that means you have 215 years on the other end of entering Egypt. Is that making sense? Okay, so there's your 430 years. 215 from the promise to Abraham to entering Egypt, 
and then another 215 from entering Egypt to the getting to Mount Sinai. Our worst case scenario, like I said, brings it down to 215 years at the most. And I don't even think it's going to be that long, as you'll see. So the Greek Septuagint for that Exodus 1240, which says lived in Egypt, that was the Masoretic text that just said lived in Egypt. In the Greek, it says they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. That, too, is dropped out of the Masoretic text. The numbers make it impossible that they lived in Egypt for 430 years, as we've shown you there. So, Exodus 12.40, um, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, which again I don't know a lot about, but it also agrees with the Greek Septuagint saying the same thing. Flavius Josephus also agrees. They left Egypt 430 years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. So Josephus is agreeing with what I've been telling you here. So, why does it say 430 years in the Masoretic? Well, again, that end makes a big difference. So, Samaritan Pentateuch, Greek Septuagint, as we've talked about before, were probably copied from an older copy. Josephus would have had access to those older copies, so he's probably getting his information from those older copies that we don't have. But that end is a very important part. I'm going to skip a few things because we've kind of covered it in this other aspect, but I just want you to see that that end Canaan was dropped out of the Masoretic text. So most of the Bibles we read for Exodus 1240 will not have that there, but we will have it in other places in our Bibles. So it's not like you can't figure it out, but a lot of people to criticize the Bible will use this Exodus 12 verse and it seems to be a little strange then. So anyway, 215 years in Egypt, but that means they would not be slaves for that long, right? Because we know Joseph was 30 years old when he was taken out of prison. We also know there was a seven year of abundance, and then two years into the famine is when Jacob comes into Egypt. That means Joseph is 39 years old when Jacob comes into Egypt when he's 130 years old. So, Joseph, being 39 when Israel enters Egypt, to begin our 215 years, we know Joseph, the Bible tells us, dies at 110. So you take your 110 when he dies, minus the 39 when Jacob is entering Egypt, that means 71 years that Israel was there under the reign of Joseph, or at least when Joseph was alive. 71 years right there. Um... We know during that time they were not slaves, for sure. So that means you can take 215 years minus 71 years, and that means at the most they could be slaves 144 years. That gets you to Sinai. Well, we can take this even more. Moses was 80 years old when they left Egypt. They must have been enslaved after the time of Joseph, which we've already talked about, but before Moses is born. 215 years in Egypt, minus the 71, under Joseph, um, let's see, equals a 64-year period for them to somewhere in that range to begin slavery. Now then, that 64 years, somewhere in there when they began to be enslaved, after Joseph dies, but yet before Moses was born, is unknown for the most part. However, assuming they enslaved between the death and the birth of Moses, then they would be enslaved at most if we just put it in the middle. Because Joseph dies and a new king is going to come up that doesn't know Joseph, probably not the moment he dies. So splitting that 64 years in half, giving it 32 years, you would have the 80 years of Moses and 32 years being in the middle. That puts it at about 112 years of slavery 
that they were enslaved. To in, in understand the 400 versus 430 years, that and is very important. In Genesis here, it says, The Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. That means that you can't just say that these 400 years are slavery, but they will be in a country, strangers in a country not their own. So they will be mistreated. Do you remember when Jacob goes to Egypt and Pharaoh says, how old are you? He says, I'm 130 and my years have been years of persecution, years of mistreatment, basically. So you can count all 130 years of Jacob's life living in Canaan, a land not his own, as part of that 400 years. In Galatians 4.29, it says, As he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, talking about Ishmael and Isaac. We know that Ishmael was about 16 years old, when he was persecuting Isaac in Scripture. Um, so we know that even at his birth, he was being mistreated, in essence, is why I'm showing you this. If the Bible says that they will be mistreated, that starts as soon as he was born. Okay? When Isaac was born. So, Abraham receives the promise... 25 years later, Isaac is born when he's 100 years old. Isaac receives the pro or Abraham receives the promise at 75. He's uh, 100 when Isaac is born. So you have those 25 years there. We know that from the receiving of the promise to the law was 430 years, according to Galatians 3. So these are just some mile markers here to, to look at. Um, then... As far as this may or may not be that important, but I'll just run through it real quick. It was when he was being weaned. The child grew and he was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And so this is when the persecution begins. According to Jewish teaching, you are weaned anytime from 18 months to 5 years old. So, assuming that you were weaned at 5 years old... If Isaac was weaned at five, you have, of that 430 years, you take away the 25 that Abraham, before he has Isaac, you take away the five of being weaned. That means he begins to be persecuted right there, 30 years after the promise was given, which means there's 400 years of being mistreated and persecuted. Exactly. There's where the 400 comes, but yet it says that they would be mistreated and in a land not their own when Abraham receives the promise. So you add those 30 years, you get your 430 years. So you get your 400 and you get your 430. God isn't using round numbers. He is using exactly what he says. In one case, he is counting the time uh, before Isaac is born. In the other case, he's not. So it just would make sense. But anyway, that's just another case of the um, Septuagint having that and in there seems to be more correct. But again, even in the Masoretic text, I believe in Galatians, it's, it has that and in Canaan, so you could still make sense of it without the Greek Septuagint. But if you only looked at that Exodus 12:40 verse in the Masoretic text, it looks like a contradiction.